Warning! This video is a retrospective, not just a review. That is, complete and utter spoilers for the story, the game's lore, and the ending. If you've come to this video from the far future of the Divinity game series, welcome! I can understand that you don't want to play a 40-plus hour game that came out about 20 years ago, but you might want to know more about the series that came before what you're probably playing now, so please enjoy and catch up on the story. Divine Divinity was released in 2002 to relatively lukewarm reviews. Number one, the title. It may as well say Redundant Redundancy since it tells me nothing about the game itself. When the game was in development, it was called Divinity, the Sword of Lies. Well, that would have been a fine title. What was wrong with that? Apparently, the title was forced onto the developers by its parent company, but it's still stupid. The title is supposed to be your selling point, along with your box art and title screen. All three are pretty uninspiring. Let me give you a hint, my fellow gamers. If you spot a barely dressed woman on the cover of a video game you're looking at, chances are it's a shitty game. Relying on sex appeal to sell interactive media works for some, but most folks know better. Who is she? No clue. Her name isn't explicitly stated anywhere that I could find. Reason number two for its lukewarm reception, Diablo 2 came out only two years before. Its explosive success set off tons of gaming companies to try and cash in on the isometric dungeon crawling genre. This coined the phrase, shitty Diablo clone, from the gaming community, and rightly so, since most of them were absolute garbage. And with a title like Divine Divinity, there's little that can be done about it since it screams mediocre fantasy game just by looking at it. But I got this game for 6 bucks on Steam, so I can't complain too much. Reason number three for its bad reception is the setting in general. Medieval Western Europe must be the place to go for RPGs. Elves hate dwarves, dwarves hate elves, orcs are stupid and warlike, and everybody's waiting for a new messiah to unite all seven races. I mean, come on, can we be a little more Tolkien? Not to mention the dragon-riding dark riders that chase you, the wizard that randomly appears saying you're a chosen one of the realm, and the duke's advisor being evil all along. The list just kind of goes on. The game's setting lacks any sort of voice or flavor to call its own, and at first glance it comes across as a lazy, thrown-together knights and wizards game. The character screen gives you six choices, the male and female versions of three classes, fighter, wizard, and survivor. Their survivor is basically a rogue or an archer. I do find it odd that the women on this screen talk like they've got something to prove. They say there are only two ways of living for a poor girl on the streets. Prostitution or starvation. I took the third way. I steal from the rich and give it all to my poor self. At least in this corrupt world, I'm a hero to myself. Who says men are stronger than women? I bested the village blacksmith at wrestling when I was 15 and killed my first man in a fair fight less than a year later. The land sickens. It needs a woman's strong hand to restore it. They call me a witch because I'm a woman and an enchantress because I'm pretty. Damn them! I deserve as much respect as any male wizard. The land is sick and in using magic to heal it, I'll earn their admiration. All three of the women talk about girl power, which makes me a little uncomfortable to tell the truth. Shouldn't they be standing on their own merits, man or woman? Why mention gender in their introduction speeches? You get all of four or five portraits to choose from, but you have no other input when it comes to character creation. You can't even pick the color of your hair, and considering the primitive things this game calls cutscenes, there's really no excuse for this. It's only about an hour into the game that we realize the classes mean absolutely nothing other than what you look like. Certain stats will start higher based on your choice, but a level up or two can cancel this out. So, much like Skyrim, there's really no class system here. You can just pick what sorts of skills you want since you have access to everything the game has to offer from the get-go. There are level thresholds to reach for some things, but if you want to be a mace-swinging wizard that lays poisonous traps for his enemies, you can. It's an open-ended skill system that leaves you with dozens of choices and you can build your hero however you like. I like that a lot. 
Everybody has access to everybody else's skills. So your choice of man or woman and what class you are is almost entirely cosmetic. I went with the beefy warrior dude here. Now, before we go any further, I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm going to completely ruin the story, so spoilers ahead. This game is over a decade old, though, so I don't think anybody will honestly care. Surely the story will be the interesting bit, right? RPGs can make up for a lot if the writing and the story is good. Our opening cutscene shows a group of cultists slaying the spirit of a goddess or something. They don't explain who that is and the three parts of her racing off to inhabit the bodies of three chosen mortals. She's only there for this cutscene, and she's never mentioned again, unless you look at the box art. I guess she's not too important, since they don't even name her. You start off in the tiny town of Alaroth, in the land of Rivalon. You also have, get this, amnesia! One of the healers found you in the woods and brought you to safety, leaving all your belongings behind. What's funny is you can actually find your old belongings here, but that's just a little detail. You can't actually pick them up. Anyway, Alaroth is now under siege by marauding orcs that can't take it upon themselves to smash through a thin wooden fence. And at the same time, the head healer of the village has gone insane. Lardani is my poor old friend. What are you doing outside? I... Oh, 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 it's you, Landilor. I, I was... Ah, oh, he will come. The end is upon us. Shiloi, you're raving, Mardanius. You must take more rest. Come, let me take you home. No, no, it's me, Landilor. Oh, come, let me make you some more of that hot tea. I will not drink your foul brew, Thelemon! Do you really think you can fool me? <laughs> Taste my power! No, Mardanius, no! I am Lanilor! So, yeah, they don't put a ton of effort into the voice acting either. One of the game's many flaws. What little voice acting there is ranges from annoying to terrible. <laughs> Did you really think you could just walk in here and kill me, dullard? <laughs> Feel my power! Oh god, who's writing this stuff? They could have left it all as text, and I honestly wouldn't have minded. Considering how good the music is, just reading what people were saying would not have bothered me. So you run around the village for a bit, getting used to the game's controls, running errands for the local townsfolk. Since everyone in Alaroth is a healer, they're all pretty kind people. Uh, except for this guy, who's racist against dwarves and grows hallucinogenic plants in his garden. And this guy, who's racist against humans. And this guy, who's racist against elves and humans. And the shopkeeper, who's a drug addict. And this guy, who's half-possessed by a dead necromancer. Have you been out on the street lately? Do you know how weird it is out there? We've taken our own head count. There seem to be three million completely miserable assholes living in the tri-state area. This is the most miserable village I have ever seen. Alaroth is where you also learn that you can fail at quests in this game. You see, the source of their healing is being tainted, so these guys are at a loss since they can't work their magic. They have two wounded soldiers and one healing crystal. If they heal one, the other dies, and since their magic is screwed up, they can't decide since saving one dooms the other. Interesting, since I can ask them for free magical healing whenever I want. How are these two soldiers any different? If you take the crystal and give it to one of the two soldiers, you fail the quest. So what do you do? Well, isn't it obvious? You gotta break into an abandoned house, steal a magic mirror, find a pool of water, drop the mirror into the pool, then drop the crystal in there as well to duplicate it. I mean, of course, right? Why didn't I think of that? If you figure that quest out, you do get a buttload of XP, but I think it was made that way so that you'd pick one of the two guys and the game can show you that it's possible to fail quests. So the wizard Mardanius has completely lost his marbles because there is evil in the catacombs below Alaroth that is making him that way. Yeah, somebody has to go down there. Somebody's gotta go down there. 
So you head down there to check it out. Turns out that by catacombs they mean the entire fucking necropolis. I killed over 500 skeletons making my way down five sprawling floors to get down to the bottom of this place. This is the first dungeon in the whole game and it's probably one of the biggest by far. A lot of new players are going to be seriously discouraged in this massive place. Either these guys are pretty shitty healers or they built this village on an Indian burial ground. They try to hand wave it and say that these are catacombs that were built by the dwarves, but there's no dwarves around here. No dwarven skeletons, no burial stuff, lore, or even architecture. The only dwarves in this game are mostly way the hell over here and over here. And if we're going to play the Tolkien fantasy card for this, this isn't a mountain. It's a flat expanse surrounded by a forest. There's no dwarven anything here. So after you make your way all the way down there, you come across Thilrion, who was a necromancer who that was trying to become immortal. His skeleton minions were left with a set of complex instructions to bring him back from the dead as an indestructible, immortal necromancer. And by complex instructions, I mean they have to pull four levers in the proper order. Huh. Didn't know necromancy was that easy in Rivalon. Anyway, you help them bring the guy back for some reason, and Thilrion rises from the grave. At last. <laughs> I have returned from the lands of the dead. I have become immortal! This is probably one of the most impressive cutscenes in the game, to be honest, so make sure you enjoy this. Yeah, we set the bar that low. Thelrion then discovers that he can still feel pain and begs you to kill him and all his servants. Because. Just because. That's kind of it. Bit of a letdown, really. I spent like five hours clawing my way to the bottom of this dungeon, and there's not even a boss fight. He just kind of stands there and begs you to kill him. You have to take on his minions straight afterwards, but they're skeletons. They die in like two hits. So you make to leave Alaroth and you're stopped because there are too many orcs out there and all the squishy healers in town need an escort to make it to Riverwood and help out with a plague that's spreading. So you wander all the way down there, doing subquests and such as you please, before getting there. Riverwood is stricken with a plague and there's nothing in any of the buildings. The entire place is pointless as a town. There's no item shops, no one to repair or identify items, no place to sleep, no nothing. I kept having to go back and forth to the starting town since you can't even get a bed at the freaking inn. It's about at this point that the game remembers it's supposed to have a plot. Curing the plague actually becomes a subquest since only three people are actually sick and they're quarantined at a part of the town that's fenced off. The main plot comes into focus at about the 10 or 12 hour mark. That's pretty far in to only suddenly start into things. Turns out that you are something called a marked one, one of three people chosen by destiny to become the divine one. You know that goddess lady from the cover at the beginning? To my understanding, she's some sort of Jesus figure that's meant to unite the six races in harmony against dark forces or something like that. When she was split into three pieces by evil cultists, one of her pieces ended up inside you. The wizard Sandalore saves your sorry butt from being toasted by a dragon rider early in the game and tells you of your destiny. He then tells you to meet him at the Dwarven Bread Inn so that you can meet up with one of the other marked ones in the process. You find out over time that a cult called the Black Ring is out to kill the Marked Ones to make sure that none of them ascend to becoming the Divine One. It's their job to spread as much chaos and mistrust between the races as they can. Doing this will strengthen their Dark Lord, the God of Chaos, so he can make his return. I didn't know chaos was actually measurable. So, you spend a good portion of the game doing subquests, leveling up, getting better gear and weapons. The meat and potatoes of the game is dungeon crawling and subquests. The questing itself is actually pretty good. It's not all fetch quests like you might expect. 
There's assassins to stop, vampires to expose, plagues to cure, guilds to join, all sorts of things. The depth of this world is actually very impressive. It's no Morrowind, but there are over 60 hours worth of gameplay here. I got a serious kick out of just running around revealing the map and running across random quests to do. It was a blast coming across new and exotic gear, magic rings, and ever stronger weapons to enjoy. The shop system is a little behind on the times, though. I had to keep running back and forth buying potions for most of the game, spending all my time and effort hunting down the merchants that carried the right size and number of potions to make them noteworthy. So much so that I had to take up alchemy and supply myself with potions so that I could save time. Those were skill points that would have been better spent elsewhere, but I had to actually invest in crafting so I could keep up with my own needs. I'm not saying that shopkeepers should have an infinite number of potions on them, but it was certainly frustrating trying to get enough to survive on before I just started making my own. The inventory system is kind of like the Ultima series. You have tabs in which to keep items and you can arrange them however you like. Your strength determines how much you can carry, and I was rarely over encumbered by loot. This arrangement actually really helped me keep track of everything I had and made items very easy to find and organize, because you carry a lot of crap with you almost all the time. Even Skyrim couldn't do this properly, so major points to the game for its excellent menu systems. It's around this part that you're summoned to meet with Duke Janus, a 12-year-old brat that just succeeded his father to the position of Duke. Not only that, but he's been running around declaring that he is the Divine One of Legend, and that everybody should follow him. You know for a fact that he's not one of the Marked Ones, so he's full of crap. He's heard of your exploits as of late, and he really likes you. So much so that he drafts you to become his bodyguard and forbids you from leaving his castle forever. What a nice kid. His guards keep you from leaving, and he sends you to do bitch quests for a bit, like you're his toy. This little shit sends you to deliver love letters, find a teddy bear, locate a cat, and a few other things. You even bear witness to him cutting some wealthy merchants' big tax breaks so that they'll support his war effort. They did a good job making me hate this kid. Though his girlfriend is pretty hot, so at least he's got good taste there. How old is Duke Janus again? Oh, right, he's 12. Ignore the last thing I said. An attempt on the Duke's life gets you kicked out and he finally tires of you. Your reputation stat takes a big hit, but it hardly matters since the game is so full of subquests to build it back up anyway. Reputation just gets you merchant discounts and a few other things, so it really doesn't matter. Meanwhile, back at the plot... The short and long of things is that the other two marked ones are killed off by the Black Ring and its agents. That leaves you as the only one who's left to assume the position of the Divine One and save the world. The wizard Zandalor tells you that you have to recover an artifact called the Sword of Lies before the Black Ring gets their hands on it. The Sword of Lies is supposed to be in the treasure vault of Duke Janus's castle, but when you go there, it's already gone. Points to Duke Janus for having the creepiest fucking vault door imaginable. I learned the password to open this thing and I still didn't want to go in. Jesus, I'm going to have nightmares about this thing. Anyway, like I said, the Sword of Lies is gone when you get there. Supposedly, it contains a tiny spark of the soul of the God of Chaos. That spark is called the Demon of Lies. Should the Black Ring make use of the sword when there's enough chaos in the world, they could open a hell mouth and summon him so he can come out and take over the world. So yeah, the tired RPG trope of we're summoning our death god is in full effect here. It's up to you to become the Divine One and to stop the Black Ring cult before they summon the God of Chaos through the power of the Sword of Lies. So, how do you become the Divine One? Well, like any good leader, you have to be elected, of course. Two thousand years ago, there was a group called the Council of Seven, representatives from each race who named a Divine One to help stop the God of Chaos and... Wait, seven? There's only six races, hang on. Humans, elves, dwarves, orcs, imps, lizards... Oh, turns out the seventh representative in the Council of Seven is Zandalor himself. Wizards, no matter their race, are considered a group of their own. Why? Because according to the man himself, it's only polite to include magic users in such things. Douchebag. 
So, using this fancy scrying room, you have to go and find the destined representatives from each race to stand together and to be the new Council of Seven. What, I can just see them wherever they are, no matter where? What if they're on the toilet, or having sex, or bathing, or something? Hell, I'm never gonna get undressed again. Kinda creepy, man. Most of the people you see are folks you've met during your travels, so they're not that hard to track down. You just have to run to where they are, solve whatever problem is keeping them there, and then tell them the secret magic word that will teleport them to the council's chambers. This stupid! Troxy wants to go to council now! Ah, it works! There's a Zelda joke to be made here, I just don't know what it is. The elf and dwarf council members are the most difficult to obtain since the Black Ring is trying to put the two races at war with each other. Turns out the Black Ring has stolen a holy relic called the Axe of Stone from the dwarves and framed the elves for it. On the other end of things, they disguise mercenary orcs as dwarves and defile elvish burial grounds. Like I said before, elves hate dwarves and dwarves hate elves. So you have to recover the Axe of Stone and the burial ground artifacts, give them back to their respective owners, and tell them to quit being so damn racist. I gotta tell you, most of the major conflicts in this game are drawn along racial lines. Everybody hates everybody. Which is probably why the Council of Seven is such a big deal, because gathering people from all the races into the same room is just inconceivable according to this game's lore. There's not been a gathering like this in our lifetime. So, after hours and hours of subquests, running all over Rivalon and gathering up the new Council of Seven, it's finally time to do this thing. Given that you've helped each individual sage, I mean council member, with their own problems, they have no problem voting yes to make you the Divine One. I too have found the Marked One full worthy. I give my agreement and seal the resolution. So, you ring the gong to call them to vote, and then they MURDER YOU WITH CHAIN LIGHTNING! Go now, Mark One. Go fulfill your destiny. I am so not kidding. Xandalore didn't say anything about me being sent to the underworld until right before it happened. So yeah, in order to stop the world-ending cult, you have to be ritualistically murdered by seven people shooting you in the face with lightning bolts. The fuck is wrong with you people? We're supposed to be stopping a cult, not starting one. I just got sacrificed in the name of fulfilling the role of a loosely defined religious figure with them hoping that I'll rise from the grave with newfound powers. That's cult activity, people! For now, we must wait. If you gentlemen are hungry, I think I remember a spell that can create us some food. Anyone got a deck of cards? Revenge does come pretty quickly, though, because as soon as you've been incinerated by your own allies, Duke Janus, that little shit, busts in with his posse of boss characters. He's possessed by the Sword of Lies, which I guess that's why it wasn't in the vault, he had it all along, to the point where he's basically gone. The Demon of Lies takes over his body, sheds the boy's skin, and then murders everybody in the room. <laughs> So much for the Council of Seven, they're brutally murdered in a shower of Sith lightning and they all go down hard. Doesn't feel very good, does it, guys? Lightning to the face is not the way to go when saving the world. So it's at this point in the game where you finally become the Divine One. You're treated to a trippy cutscene where your soul, which is shaped like a woman, by the way, I guess it's supposed to be that angel lady from the start, I don't know is infused with the powers it needs to take on the ultimate evils in the world. It honestly looks like the spirits of the council members are beating the hell out of your soul, though. It's really violent looking. Turns out these are supposed to be the gods of the seven races or something, but this cutscene doesn't have any words in it, so it's really hard to tell what's actually going on. Then you turn into an angel and fly away through hyperspace, I guess.
Several months later, in the land of the living, you reincarnate with all your gear and items, as before, as the Divine One, the Savior of the world, the evil-stopping badass you were destined to be, though this does bring someone else immediately to my mind. I am literally the Christ figure of your fucking religion! So, what do you get when you become the title-holding savior of all Rivalon? Anika! Well, actually, you get five free level-ups and a new skill tree to play with. That's pretty much it. I didn't use any of these new spells since it was too late in the game at this point to really experiment outside the build I'd chosen. Kind of a waste, really. If I'd become the Divine One much earlier, I might have played with some of these new abilities, but by then I was pushing level 40, and the game stops at around level 50, so I had other things to spend my skill points on by that point. Turns out Zandalore, his talking cat Aru, and Croxy, the orc council member, survived the attack and teleported away before the Demon of Lies could murder them with Sith Lightning too. The final chapter of the game is the Wasteland, and the final dungeon awaits. Now, I'd like to share with you my favorite detail about this game. Since I'm a D&D &D nerd, I like looking at dungeons and ruins to admire their creativity. The Wastelands was actually the home of the Orcs long ago. You get a vague hint that this used to be a good land and then it wasn't anymore, probably because of the Black Ring's poisonous marshes. If you scout the area and look at the map, you can see the remains of what was once a huge settlement. If this was an Orc region, that implies that the Orcs had a city at some point. Not only that, but it was huge. This is Verdistus, the human city. It's by far the biggest and most populated area in the game. Coming back to the wastelands, if these ruins are to be believed and they're not just randomly placed across the map by some lazy developer, that would mean that the orc city would look something like this. The maroon lines represent fortification walls. The red is the buildings that are still standing. Now, if the walls and the crumbling bits that are just all over the region are to be taken as literal, that would mean that the buildings would have looked something like this. Holy crap, it's huge! That's what she said. Not only are the orcs more populous, but their city was so vast that it covered the entire region with all of its structures. Look at them all! The orc buildings that you see in the game right now are all tents and encampments and things, but apparently they once had the capacity to build stonework cities if these ruins are to be believed. It's pretty interesting. Now you could go straight into the final dungeon, but there are a few more subquests, a couple of epic weapons, and even a dragon to meet before you go charging down there. I like the dragon a lot. I'm glad that Divine Divinity held respect for dragons and that you really never fight many and they're not used as regular enemies for anything. In a game about fast-paced combat, it would have cheapened the majesty of what dragons are. Instead, you have to meet this dragon in the wastelands to learn a spell to cross the poisonous swamps that lead to the final dungeon. The waters there will kill you if you touch them, so you have to be something incorporeal in order to get across. So, you learn the spell from him turn into a ghost, Woo, I'm a ghost, cross the waters, and there's the final dungeon. Gotta say, I love the architecture in some of these locations, but the final dungeon is, uh, uninspired. Remember the five bosses that busted in with Duke Janus to kill the Council of Seven? Well, by this point in the game, you've bested each of them already. Now you have to go fight all five of them again, each inside their own fortress. The final dungeon is literally a series of mazes, each one with a boss at its center. I know this game is about dungeon crawling and that I shouldn't be complaining about actually crawling dungeons at the end, but this just felt like busy work. Maze after maze, hallway after hallway, it all looks the same. The lighting in this area is weird, ranging from blue and green to yellow and neon pink. I know it's supposed to look otherworldly and unnerving, but it just made me feel like I was at a rave party or something. There's nothing intimidating about pink glowing crystals, I'm sorry. I don't care how many gargoyles you throw at me or how winding your maze is. By this point in the game, you're so powerful that the Demon of Lies' cohorts are basically pushovers. You can freeze most of them in place with ice magic then just wail on them while they stand there helplessly. Ice magic in general breaks the game wide open since there are so few creatures that can resist it, but it was kind of funny to end out the game by freezing each boss in place like a cheap bastard. That's what they get for making me run through all those damn mazes. 
Anyway, four of the five bosses are pushovers, basically amped up versions of what they were before. But one of them is actually a very difficult fight. Josephina. Have you any idea how much trouble you've put us all through? Naughty, naughty child. Bad children get punished. Josephina has a practically game-breaking fighting strategy and really is the only boss in the entire game that's worth going into detail about. She blinds you, summons a shield onto herself, summons helpers to fight you in melee, and then spams AoE spells. Since you can't see her or even move properly for 90% of the fight, you can't hit her in melee and you can't aim magic spells at her either. One of the only ways it's even remotely possible to defeat Josephina is to learn an AoE spell like Hell Spikes and then just spam it at her. Because of Josephina's shield, you can always see where she is even if you're blinded. I guess since it's AoE, you just have to point it in her general direction. So I backed her into a corner to Hell Spike her to death, but the fight is still very intense and very resource costly. If you defeat Josephina, you deserve a medal, and you are certainly worthy of the title Divine One. So, with all his minions dispatched, it's finally time for the showdown with the Demon of Lies, the evil spark of the Dark God himself. But it's too late. He succeeds in his ritual to summon the Chaos God into the mortal form of a newborn baby. We're too late, but we still have a demon to stop. So I strapped on my best gear, brought out my best potions, and stepped up to go into the final maze of the dungeon, which resembles the Outback Steakhouse logo for some reason. Yeah, I know it's supposed to be a demon skull, but it still looks silly. Shaping buildings like other things is just dumb. Half the rooms don't even have anything in them other than normal enemies. The game was generous with enemies in this area, though, giving me enough XP for one last level up before facing down the demon himself. The dungeon isn't complicated, you just have to throw two levers and it opens the last door. Ooh, that's high-end RPG tactics there. So after taking on Josephina, I had no idea what to expect. What horrible hell magics would this thing bring down on me? What foul sting would I feel from his claws? What? Oh, you can just freeze him in place with the ice spell and whack him until he dies. Never mind then. I guess Josephina should have been in charge of things. This guy's a wuss. So the Demon of Lies goes back to hell. You send the Sword of Lies with him so that no one else can use it to summon him again. On the altar is the newborn baby, the mortal incarnation of the Chaos God, so we can finally end this. Or not. Why did we not kill the child? He is literally the reincarnation of an evil god. He's mortal and helpless. You can kill him. You can put this whole thing to rest. Just kill him. Ugh. But no, the Divine One can't bring himself to slay a defenseless baby, despite the metric butt-ton of other things he's killed to get where he is. Despite the circumstances, no witnesses, and the prophetic guarantee that this baby is going to grow up to be the ultimate evil, he just can't do it. I had pretty mixed feelings about this ending. Maybe I'm just heartless. So the Divine One is going to be raising the reincarnated Chaos God. Roll credits! Yeah, not like this is going to bite us in the ass later on. Oh, right, yes it does. <sighs> okay, so, final thoughts on this game. It's not bad, but it's just been done better. Larian Studios wanted a piece of the Diablo 2 pie, and this was their offering for the dungeon crawling craze when it happened. It's got more than its fair share of glitches, I gotta say. I saw enemies trapped in walls, broken quest lines, objects highlighting under developer tool names, that was weird, shadowing problems, enemies pausing before they fall down to die, all sorts of bugs and bits that honestly could have been fixed. I'm sure there's probably a patch out there, but I'm here to judge the original game in its original format, not mod it all up to make it playable. It's the developer's job to polish something so the glitches stay in. I was really sad for one of the broken quest lines. I was gathering a legendary set of dragon armor, and the quest line doesn't work past a certain point. You're supposed to track down the breastplate in Verdistus, the human city. 
the guy that has it wants you to settle someone's debt to him, which amounts to about 2,500 gold, and by then you're swimming in money, so it's nothing. But when you give him the gold, he doesn't give you the breastplate, he just sends you out on the same errand again. I tried lots of different ways to make this quest work, talking to various people, visiting different forums, but it just doesn't work. So I missed out on a very important set of items. But, given how much of a wuss the final boss is, I guess I really didn't need it too much. I like collecting exotic armor sets in games, that's what I do. To see an epic quest line like this grind to a halt because of bad programming just broke my heart. Another thing I just have to talk about in this game is the women. Remember back at the start I mentioned that the character selection screen had weird things to say if you picked a female character? Well, in the opening village where you spend the first 10 to 12 hours of the game, there are no women. An entire village of healers, and there's no priestesses or midwives, no female healers of any sort? Nope. In fact, you don't see any women at all in this game until you get to Riverwood, the second town. I know I'm nitpicking this, but after playing the entire game, I realized all the women in this game are either evil, poor, or prostitutes. You see a group of them gossiping in Verdistus, but they talk like cutthroat hens at a sewing circle. None of the major shopkeepers are women, none of the guildmasters, none of the Council of Seven, which blew my mind, by the way. You have a representation of all the races, but they all just happen to be men. Nothing. Maybe it's the medieval setting, but there's absolutely no significant women in this game that aren't boss characters. All the enemies in this game that are of the seven races are male, and one of the only explicitly female enemies in this game is a succubus. I guess it's just a boys club here at Divine Divinity. Josephina is literally the only strong female lead we have, and she's ironically the most difficult fight in the entire game. It's weird. But it's not all bad. Some of the finer details are really neat. There's references to Stephen King books, Sir Isaac Newton, The Sword in the Stone, The Holy Grail. There's even a special armor set named after the studio, the Larian armor. The game is pretty self-aware in its humor, which carries its own charm outside of the cookie-cutter, unoriginal setting. The in-jokes do get pretty funny once you start looking for them. I'm not really a rated out of 10 kind of guy here on D&D Stories, but if I had to put a number to it, I'd probably give this game a 4 out of 10. Slightly below average. It's an okay game, it functions well, and it's satisfying to play, but when you step back and look at it, it's below average. It's a Diablo 2 clone riddled with glitches, blatant sexism, and a really cookie-cutter setting. If not for its self-aware humor and different jokes to make you laugh, there would have been no saving this one from the trash bin. I don't regret playing it for its $6 price tag, but I won't be recommending it to anybody either. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn about the next game in the Divinity series, Beyond Divinity, stay tuned. I'll have a retrospective for that game up very soon. The Path of Larian's game series marches on with lore books, vast gameplay improvement, and a much better story than this game ever had. See you next time, and keep gaming.